Hi, I'm Kirstie Allison Ampey, Chair of the Arlington School Committee, and I'd like to call this regular meeting of Thursday, April 27th to order. Um, first, I'd like to welcome our, or first I want to make sure that our remote people can hear us. Ms. Ferrante, can you, can you speak yes, to? Yes, Okay, I yes, can hear you. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm not sure if there's anyone else who's, I don't see anyone else who's participating full time, so, okay. Um, we will begin with public comment. Before we begin, I'd like to review sections of our policy BEDH, which governs public comment. During the public comment segment of regular meetings of the committee, individuals or group representatives may address the committee on items of school business. The length of public participation should normally be no more than 20 minutes, but may be extended by the chair. Speakers must identify themselves by name and address and will be allowed up to three minutes to present their material. The chair may reduce the speaking time if needed or may permit an extension. Improper conducts and remarks, including obscenity or abusive language, will not be allowed. Defamatory or abusive remarks are always out of order. If a speaker persists in improper conduct or remarks, the chairman, chair may terminate that individual's pri privilege of address. All remarks will be addressed through the chair of the meeting. Speakers may <coughs> offer such object criticisms of the school operations and programs as concern them, but in public session, the committee will not hear personal complaints about school personnel nor against any member of the school community except for the school committee or the superintendent in their capacity as the operational leader of the Arlington Public Schools. Under most circumstances, administrative channels are the proper means for disposition of legitimate complaints involving staff members. The public is reminded that the school committee does not hold jurisdiction over the performance of school personnel other than the superintendent. So, Mr. Schlickman will time for me. The first person we have is Ms. Sarah Barton. <clears throat> Sarah Barton, 57 Huntington Road, um, and I'm also the CPAC co-chair. So, dear school committee members, the April 13th school committee meeting left me feeling very uneasy. While I realize that public comment is not under your control, the one-sided misinformation of the public participation that night needs to be addressed. As well, it was disappointing and frustrating to hear the committee spend time discussing policy changes designed to avoid confrontation rather than facing intolerance head on with a direct and full-throated affirmation of this district's commitment to equity and inclusion for our gender diverse students. To understand even just one reason why your proactive support is so crucial, I would like to read part of the statement drafted by CPAC on the importance of the updated health and human development curriculum for the health and well-being of disabled students. Disabled people have long faced substantial cultural barriers to accessing relationship and sexuality education. They are less likely than their typically functioning classmates to receive reliable and accurate information on sexuality and relationships from their parents or peers. And I would refer you to the CECAS publication, Comprehensive Sex Education for Youth with Disabilities, for an overview of this history of inequity. In addition, evidence indicates that neurodivergent youth are more likely than their neurotypical peers to identify as gender diverse and with a sexual orientation outside of the heteronormative. As a result, neurodivergent students are both more reliant on in-school lessons on human development as well as more likely to be adversely impacted by their erasure of gender diverse identities and language from the curriculum when compared with their neurotypical peers. It's imperative for the health and well-being of these students and many others that you as a school committee explicitly reaffirm the district's commitment to gender inclusive relationship and sexuality education. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. David Bricklin Small. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is David Bricklin Small. I live at 58 Paul Revere Road. Um, uh, wrote it on my phone, so I'll just read it. I stand in support of the changes to the fourth and fifth grade human growth and development uh, curriculum. Um, there's been an argument made that says, let our children be children. 
And I agree, my 10-year-old child identifies as non-binary. They are a non-binary child. They are not confused about this at all. Neither are my wife and I, nor are their seven-year-old sister. Neither are their friends, family members, and community members who know, love, and accept our child. This may seem new and more emergent than it has ever seemed. However, expressions of gender that are non-binary have been well-documented feature of cultures throughout time. It is safe, healthy, and appropriate to share this age-appropriate information with our fourth and fifth graders. I don't worry about their confusion now. What I worry about is the many children who do not see themselves as fitting neatly into binary gender identities, who struggle profoundly with mental health crises, including high rates of suicide, when their gender identity is denied, distorted, denigrated, or demeaned. I also worry about the children who do fit into the historically traditional male female designation who will undoubtedly come across those of different identity expressions in their youth and adulthood. Let these children too learn that gender assigned at birth and gender identity are not always the same thing. They won't be confused. I think those of us who have been taught only one way of looking at things may be confused. We may need to adjust our view of things. So yes, let our children be children. Thank goodness they are impressionable to such important validating and valid information. I'm confident that they can and will understand the diversity of human and gender expression. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Dan Gillis. Hello, my name is Dan Gillis, uh, 20 Alpine Street. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm a proud resident of Arlington and I'm here to support the updated health and wellness curriculum, curriculum materials. My daughter is a fourth grade transgender student, but more importantly, my daughter is an inspiration to me. She innately understood that her identity did not match what was assigned to her at birth, telling us at an early age that she thought she was a girl and was unable to be anyone else. What is equally inspirational, though, has been the response of her student peers. Children really are the best of us, understanding and including my daughter, learning, laughing, and playing with her like anyone else in their class or on the playground. Transgender and non-binary kids exist. To the kids in my daughter's class, the updated curriculum makes sense. They see and understand not just themselves, but their transgender and non-binary friends and schoolmates that are part of their social fabric. To remove gender identity from the curriculum would disenfranchise students like my daughter, causing confusion and heightened anxiety for her and her peers. Let our children be children and give them the benefit of the doubt. In fourth grade, they are a lot smarter than you think they are. I applaud the administration for giving my daughter a chance to see her, her, herself and the identities of, all, of her, all her peers reflected in this curriculum. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Catherine Byers. Good evening. My name is Catherine Byers. I live at 62 Summit Street in Arlington. I am the parent of a Pierce Elementary School third grader. My child started talking about their gender as a toddler, and they've consistently told us that their gender assigned at birth does not match their gender identity. Around kindergarten, they began using non-binary to describe their gender experience. Starting in preschool, my concerns for my child's safety have been significant. Anytime they start a new class, activity, camp, or program, I must consider whether they will be safe and supported by the adults and the children in the environment. These concerns are not uncommon for parents, but they are amplified for the parents of transgender children. This year alone, more than 400 anti-trans bills have been proposed to legislatures around our country. These bills seek to remove children from loving and supportive homes. They seek to limit access to health care. They limit children's ability to, to use the bathrooms and to play sports. To say that transgender children in the United States are under attack is not hyperbole. While most of these attacks are outside of New England, they are creating a culture of fear that affects transgender people everywhere. Parents of transgender children know that our children's safety is not a given. In Arlington, I've generally found the schools to be a supportive place for my child. The wider community is for the most part safe. 
However, my child has been bullied for their gender by Arlington Public School students, and they are regularly misgendered by children and adults. When I reviewed the public school's new health and safety curriculum, I was relieved. The outdated curriculum that didn't include my child had been replaced. The new curriculum not only includes my child, but it works to ensure their safety. My relief was short-lived. Over the past few weeks, I've questioned my child's safety many times. Transphobic, transphobic commentary was given space and voice, while others were told not to attend meetings. The process of challenging the curriculum has emboldened anti-trans rhetoric. The public nature of the challenge has caused many to fear for the safety of their children. Parents on both sides of this debate have questioned if their child was safe at school. The policies around curriculum challenge have brought divisiveness into our community. We need a better process. As a community, we need to figure out how to move forward from this challenge. Everyone needs a renewed sense of safety and trust. This must include clear messages of support for the safety of transgender students. It must include work with the wider community to understand that trans students are human beings worthy of dignity and respect. It cannot include dialogue that questions the sanity or identity of any Arlington Public School student. All of our students deserve to feel safe at school. Thank you. Next, next is Claire Johnson. <clears throat> Hi, <clears throat> my name is Claire Johnson. I live at 84 Wright Street in Arlington. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity to offer public comment tonight. <clears throat> I would like to address the district's gender inclusive grade four and five human growth development curriculum. I watched the public comments made during your last meeting when three residents criticized the district for its gender inclusive curriculum. I understand for some people who do not have transgender or non-binary people in their lives, the idea, of, the idea of a grade four health curriculum that is inclusive of all genders, male, female, trans, non-binary, can be confusing or even scary. But it is my hope that people for whom the topic of gender diversity is new or unfamiliar can find a way to empathize with their neighbors who are themselves transgender or non-binary or who parent children who are. I hope that they can come to understand how confusing and even terrifying it can be for a child to be told that what they experience in their own bodies and minds isn't real. My family is gender diverse and we are incredibly grateful for the experiences we have had with the Arlington Public Schools where teachers, staff understand and recognize gender diversity. We are thankful for the QSAs and the GSAs and the DIGS and the Rainbow Alliance groups that affirm inclusivity and belonging for children and adolescents of all genders. We feel fortunate to live in a town where so many people recently voiced support of curricula that is inclusive of students of all genders. I want to end my remarks by urging each member of the school committee to exercise your power as an elected official to strongly support the APS administration's efforts to bring gender diversity into the curricula. From Florida, Tennessee, and Texas to some municipalities here in Massachusetts, other elected officials are doing just the opposite. Those actions are having and will continue to have devastating consequences for children and their families. Please do not let it happen here. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And last we have Julia Tuareg, um, who's on Zoom. She's muted, I'm trying to get her to unmute. Okay. Uh, Hello. Oh, um, my name is Julia Tuareg. I live at Four Colonial Drive in Arlington. Um, my husband and I are looking forward to sending our son to kindergarten at Hardy next year, but the process of securing aftercare has been deeply discouraging with all programs, those operated by the town and private options for which transportation is available being heavily oversubscribed. Um, I understand that after school demand is a recognized issue and that it is addressed to some extent in the strategic plan. 
And I was also informed by the Hardy After School Program site coordinator that additional resources may be hired over the summer. In the short term, I would like to urge the public schools to take steps to try to increase capacity for the fall and in the long term, continue to take steps towards permanent changes in after school capacity to reflect the reality and needs of Arlington families. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes public comment. I didn't say this at the start, but we just hear public comment. We don't dialogue or respond. Um, next, we have the public, the school public hearing on school choice. Um, it is the policy of this school district not to admit any non-resident students under the terms and conditions of the inter-district school choice law, MGL 76, 112B. This decision must be reaffirmed annually prior to June 1st by a vote of the school committee following a public hearing. So is there anyone here for the school choice hearing? Seeing none, I declare the, the hearing closed and I would like a motion to affirm our decision to not admit non-resident students. I move that we notify the Massachusetts Department of Education that Arlington will not be participating in the school choice program for the 2023-24 school year due to lack of capacity. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? So that's a 7-0 um, vote. So now the hearing is closed and we move on to our business. Um, the student representatives, we have Mo Nathan, I'm sorry, I don't have your, Hagen's book? Thank you, Mew. Blair. Oh. Um, so, I mean, strangely there is actually a lot to say, mm -hmm. given that we had a week off of break, so that was a week of no school. Um, but today was actually the last day of our inclusion and diversity workshops. And at least from my experience and those who I've talked to, it went really, really well. People have like loved seeing the representation and the conversation stirred by these workshops. Um, it is also entering the AP weeks, the first series of exams starting next week. So people are a little like on edge, but we are having these like cookies and cram study sessions with like uh, National Honor Society tutors, and the media center and people are just like buckling down to get ready for the exams. Uh, there's the Pops musical performance. That was, I don't know exactly when it's happening. But Saturday it's, and Sunday. Yeah. 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 Soon. Um, there also is a, I believe it's going on right now, an art show um, downstairs on the first floor of the new building. And I think that's it. Okay. Thank you very much. And I forgot to acknowledge Ms. Ferrante, who's our AEA representative, who's joining us on Zoom. So, hi, Ms. Ferrante. And next, we have the K-12 science report with uh, Sam Hoyer. Hoyer. Dr. Hoyer. Dr. Yep. Hoyer. Yes. Um, yeah, so I have your the PDF, but I don't have the Google. That's all right. That'll work? <laughs> Talk to home and I will make it make it work. <laughs> I like to go with the flow. You know how I am. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello. Oh, it's so nice to see you. I feel like we don't spend enough time together. So you should stop by anytime. Fifth floor, new building, beautiful view. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next, please. So I just wanted to start by acknowledging. Uh, district vision. Um, I think this is something that all of the curriculum directors and teachers and students um, are really, really excited about, especially this idea of belonging, growth, and joy. All right? I think that that is education in a nutshell, um, and it kind of speaks to what we were talking about here during public comment, as well as where we want to go and really give students a sense of belonging, a sense of joy and allow them to grow as people. Again, acknowledging our strategic plan and goals, uh, we're really kind of focusing in the science department on strategic priority one. And 
yeah, I, we can go on to the next one, really. So just to start with our elementary update, um, our science program specialist is continuing her support with co-teaching of lessons. Uh, she does ACE block facilitation as well as new teacher support. Um, we are looking to strengthen our assessment system. Our biggest point of, of data within assessment are our um, common assessments. We give them three times a year. And we then sit with a team uh, of teachers and we look to see how we can better the curriculum and how we can drive instruction. So we use our common assessments as a way to ensure that the curriculum that we have laid out is working for all students. Um, and then we are looking to also strengthen science practices by using phenomena-driven storylines. This is a new way of teaching science um, that has research, um, it's research-based. <clears throat> it is something that DESI is really putting uh, a lot of energy into and a lot of professional development. And so we're really working on that as well. Uh, yep, so for Gibbs and OMS, probably the most exciting thing, March Mammal Madness. I don't know if anybody is involved in March Mammal Madness, but if you aren't, you should be. <laughs> so March Mammal Madness uh, is something put out by the University of Arizona, and I started it in Gibbs last year, and we got it to be a school-wide event. Um, it was really, really exciting to walk down the hallways and hear kids talking about their brackets and what mammals or what animals were battling against what and who won and why they won, and, and that was really exciting. Um, and then Audison this year, took that on and they also did it as a whole school event. Um, and I, I think it went really, really well. Um, it seems from the teachers that I've spoken to and the students that I've spoken to that they really, really enjoyed that. Uh, and it was just another way of bringing kids together and making them excited about science. Um, again, strengthening the science practices, um, because right, it's those science practices that we want to foster because that is what they are going to be able to use regardless of what career paths they take. So it doesn't matter if you're an artist or you know, an engineer, those science practices are really the ones that are gonna help you be able to move forward in your career. We are also um, implementing and strengthening our online simulation and part of the reason for that is that Massachusetts is attempting to change what the MCAS looks like for grades five and eight uh, through the innovative assessment. And I'm really excited about the innovative assessment. I think it can be really, really interesting and really do amazing things for science instruction because it's not regurgitation of content knowledge it's the application of science and the application of knowledge. Um, and so it uses simulations for, for students to be able to gather data and then interpret the data and use the data. Um, so we are really strengthening that in our, in our uh, six through eight uh, grade levels. And then we put a really big investment into equipment and materials, especially at the middle school. Um, because our, our high school has this brand new facility. We got a lot, lots of equipment um, and our elementary schools are really um, well stocked with the FOSS kits that we purchased several years ago. And so now we're just beefing up that middle school um, material and um, equipment base that we have. At the high school, um, we're trying to support our struggling students, and part of that was through the revamping of our grade nine physical science curriculum, where we just changed the order in which we develop uh, and give students um, content. And the reason for that is that kinematics is very math focused, 
and we don't seem to get kids excited by the math. I, I know, crazy. Um, <laughs> and then by a month in, they're, they're like, I hate this class. So we changed our structure, we changed it around so that they're doing a lot more hands-on experiments, a little bit less math. Um, and so that by the time we get to this really hard stuff, they're fully invested in the course. Uh, we've seen a dramatic increase in test scores. We gave the same test last year as this year. Um, the class average last year was probably like 70, 75. This year it went up to an 85, 90. So we're really seeing <clears throat> that just changing the structure and changing the order of material um, can be helpful for students. We're really improving collaboration and student ag agency. We're emphasizing hands-on learning. That's the best part of science. Um, and then we're also working on layered and standards-based curriculum. We had some new electives this year. Uh, we offered entomology, AP Physics C, electricity and magnetism, weather and climate, as well as exercise and physiology. The other goal that we have as a department is to really explore how science moves beyond the classroom and the lab to have both significant and tangible impacts on areas such as social, environmental, and racial justice. So our action steps for next year, um, you know, continuing what we're doing. Um, and then this one I, I'm really excited about, but we're looking to realign and redesign the science curriculum based on our new ALA curriculum. Um, I think we can do really good work through integration, um, and I'm excited to do that work with the ELA team as well as the social studies team. And again, going into that interdisciplinary lesson piece. At Gibbs and OMS, really looking at grading for equity. Um, I'd we are thinking about doing a book study as a middle school next year. And then I'm working with Mr. Mason to hopefully upgrade some of those OMS science spaces. And then finally for AHS, thinking about, based on our need, uh, creating an SEI course, uh, an SEI science course, because a lot of times science is learning a brand new language in addition to trying to learn English. Um, and that can be really difficult for some of our ELs. And so really having that support of a science teacher with an EL instructor working together um, could be, make really good gains for our students. And then really thinking again about the heterogeneous grouping initiative and seeing how is that going in ELA and is that something that we can do in science? Any questions, anything I can help answer, discuss, talk about? Any, any questions? <clears throat> yes, sir. Mr. Thielman. Thank you, Dr. Hoyle. Uh, <clears throat> the SEI class, could you just speak about, is that for, is that one specific discipline in science or is that a general science class or what are you, what are you thinking? That's a great question. Um, we would like it to be either uh, physical science or biology because those are our MCAS tested subjects. Right. Um, and that is where, you know, we, we see a lot of our ELs struggle to pass the MCAS and so we want to be able to give them extra support to be able to do that so that they can graduate. So it would start off as either one of those, depending on the numbers, yeah. is really kind of where we're at as well as depending on what the EL, um, the EL team is able to help us support. Because you would have to have support in that classroom. Presumably. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to have two adult, two, yes. two professionals in the classroom. Exactly. Exactly yeah, right. It. Okay. And you don't have a number at all? Or? No. So we're right now we're working on scheduling. Okay. Um, the heterogeneous grouping initiative, is that, could you just speak a little bit about how you're going to plug into this Arlington High School work on that? So we did a lot of work uh, last year to kind of try to get uh, heterogeneous grouping off the ground in science. The community felt we weren't ready to do that work. Um, we agreed and, and we said we really want to try to work on trying to do that. So we're really thinking about how do we shift our teaching so that we're able to better differentiate within a class for students who struggle 
um, with, with certain aspects and students who are high achievers and how do we make that work for everyone in the room. And so we're looking at different ways to differentiate. We're looking at changing how we offer the, the curriculum and, and what ways we do that. Um, so we, we, we're just starting to engage in that work. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Morgan. I have two questions. One that um, parallels what Jeff's saying. I think um, what I see as different from ELA in science, and you alluded to this in your presentation, is that there is this link to math, right? right. <laughs> that's, that's very different. And in fact, the, the honors physical science class is the only one, to my knowledge, that for entering ninth graders this year actually does have a caveat of, if you have not already taken algebra one, this may not be a good option for you. So it's, it's kind of the only, it's actually the only one that's sort of left now without, like there's no teacher recommendations for the rest of them, but there, that remains, you know, pro, I mean, it, it's tough to, it, it's, F equals MA is really hard without like some kind of algebra piece, yeah. right? So I guess I, I see that as being um, somewhat needing to parallel what happens at the Audison around math and, and how, you know, what that looks like and how those pathways sort of sort themselves out. Yeah. So, I, and I'm sure, I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't, <laughs> you don't know, right? I just think it's important that we acknowledge that it's, there are some significant differences and that 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 algebra piece is, is tricky. I guess the other thing I was hoping that you could speak to a little bit that I didn't see in the slides is sort of your philosophy and the department's philosophy around climate science, right? I very much believe that like we need to uh, expose all kids to rigorous science curriculum and then we need to provide, you know, kids at the high school level with, you know, um, opportunities to excel and grow and push because ultimately they're going to save all of us, or actually we're all not going to be here, but they're going to save our like grandchildren, right? Um, so, so how does that touch, I assume it, it touches everywhere within, um, but, but I'd be curious, you know, sort of philosophically how you see that as part of what we do here. Yes, um, and, and this is where, it, so let, let me answer your, your first question with regards to the math piece first, and, and yeah. um, that is our biggest stumbling block, is students understand conceptually a lot of the, the physics concepts that we, we do, and it's the math piece that struggle that they struggle with, which is why for our most struggling students, we switch the order, right? So that they get a little bit more math, high school math um, behind them, so that by the time we get to that kinematics, they're a little more confident and they're interested in the subject. So yes. So this is something that Mr. Coleman and I have been talking about and trying to figure out you know, how do we have common language? A, a lot of times when we're trying to teach the math, it's, you know, we're, we're looking at a graph of, let's say, uh, velocity versus time, and we call it velocity versus time, but in math class they call it x versus y, and students have a hard time looking at both of those things and saying, oh, they're the same. It's just different terminology. And so, Ms. Coleman and I have been working on how do we work together to give students common language in math and science. I think that will help and go a long way. Um, and I think we need to think about what is it that's important to us. Most of the physical science um, MCAS, or the, I guess it's the introductory physics MCAS, uh, is conceptual. So the math that students need is not as advanced as, you know, deep algebra one. So that by the end of the first year uh, of high school, they should be able to do that. And how can we still give that to the students who need it, but then offer extensions to those that have the math skills to, to go a little further. So that's, that's part of our differentiation work. How do we make it work for all students in the same room? Um, because even within our honors, course or our curriculum A course, we have students whose skills vary very diversely in math, and so we're working on that as well. As far as climate science, um, my philosophy is that it's extremely important. I, I think that, like you said, it, it, 
students now are the ones that are going to save the planet, right? And unfortunately, the standards that are set out by the state do not put an emphasis on that. And so we try to integrate it as much as we can. And that's why I was talking about how do we as science teachers really implement social, environmental, racial justice into the work that we do um, and still teach the standards, right? Because that is what you've hired us to do. And so it's a fine balance between those two things. Um, within the high school, we offer weather and climate so that students are really able to understand uh, that aspect of it, as well as our env environmental science courses. They really do put an emphasis on both of those things. Outside of that, there's very little, I, I will be honest. Um, and I think we could do more work towards moving in that direction. It's just a matter of finding the time. How, how do we find the time to hit all of the standards that the state has put forth and add this really important piece? And so finding that, that integration and how that fits is, is complex, right? Um, because how do you talk about that in a chemistry class where you're learning about atoms, right? And so it gets a little tricky. And so there's some massaging that's gonna have to happen. And, and I think our teachers are up for it. We just need to have the time to figure that out. That's great, yeah, no, I think it's, I mean, mm -hmm. it is. <laughs> it, I don't know, there's not, not gonna be a lot of atoms to, to look at. Right, right. I mean, yeah. that's kind of how it's going to be. So, thank you. Thanks yeah, very much. Mr. Schlickman? Or maybe the wrong kind of atoms, a little too much carbon dioxide. Yeah. Go. Um, is there a movement among science teachers in Massachusetts to adjust the standards to include this? So, the standards just changed. Mm -hmm. I, I say just changed, uh, they changed in 2016. But when the standards change, the state has five years to implement the new standards. Mm -hmm. So last year was the first year that the high school standards had to be in effect um, for, for the new standards. So I, I'm not anticipating anything changing, at least for the next 10 years or so. Well, I was just wondering if there's something that uh, school committees could do in conjunction with uh, science teachers to uh, make some adjustments. I mean, I, I think it is a really important topic for us to cover, and, and I get lots of, you know, concerns from parents saying we need to do more of this, and I absolutely agree we do. Um, and, and so, yeah, maybe I, I, I can reach out to, to colleagues, to other cur uh, curriculum directors, and see is there something in the works, and, and how can we help support that? I mean, certainly... Um Certainly, we, we have an obligation to do this, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a science teacher I, by, by trade. Um, uh, so, to the, to, to the extent of maybe we can get integrate that somewhere like seventh grade where, there's, where there isn't an, M, an MCAS and really come in strong there and use that as a foundation for building in? Yeah, so... What's hard about science MCAS is yes, there isn't a science MCAS in grade seven, mm -hmm. but our grade eight MCAS it's is cumulative, cumulative yeah. right? And so mm -hmm. what do we take out and what do we put in is a really fine balance. Um, but maybe, Ms. Moran, uh, we can talk about something for civics day mm -hmm. and, and maybe it could be part of the, you know, an integrated unit for in conjunction with civics. I've always found that the math and ELA MCAS, which focus more on skills, exactly. is certainly a, a more valid instrument, and it's really difficult to have a science MCAS that's a valid measure of, uh, of what students are able to do. Um, and to tie, to wrap that in, into a graduation requirement, I think is just absolutely wrong, and it, it's, limiting our ability to work with kids. And the other thing is with abandoning the chemistry MCAS for high school, mm -hmm. that traditionally has been in many districts the route that they're going to take with their uh, L students. Exactly. And by 
forcing L students to take and pass an MCAS that is more language based, mm -hmm. I think is a tremendous disadvantage for the kids. Uh, and I'm glad you're bringing this up that Arlington is committed to working through this problem in order to serve the second language learners who are uh, attending our high school. Mm -hmm. uh, I also want to say that I, it, I'm, I'm glad you're here uh, and you brought the joy back into the front of the presentation. That when the kids were with us in the initial process of developing the mission vision statements, mm -hmm. Uh, joy and empowerment were two of the key features in there and the more we can do that the better and I know that you're really driven to do both and the, the science instruction in this district is, uh, is, is high is top-notch and uh, getting better every year thank you and I'm always looking forward to seeing you uh, as for the mammals yes sir can you t you know we're, you didn't bring any I mean, I can go get some. <laughs> I know we had a snake up here last week. Yeah. I, I, I met it's the not, snake. It's not a mammal. I know it's, it's not a mammal. <laughs> but, but you were able to bring the snake up, so why not something furry and happy? I, I will tell you, I don't do furry and happy. <laughs> um, furry and sad. Cockroaches, I've got, I've got cockroaches. They're not mammals either. No, they're not. They're not. That's why I'm saying I, I actually... March Mammal Madness is great, but I don't do mammals personally. So <laughs> <laughs> reptiles, you know, amphibians, those are insects, those are my jam. So if you want any of those, I can bring them up next time. Yeah, I, 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 I love seeing animals. We, we had the snake up, well, I, I think there, I've got colleagues that might not be too happy about it, so <laughs> I wouldn't push the issue. But last week when I came up to sign the warrant, uh, I met I met your snake Ember, yeah Ember, uh, and uh, it was a cuddly little thing, wasn't he? Yeah, they 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 are great. Ember is uh, they them pronouns uh, to just help with this idea of you know sometimes we don't know the sex right, and and so we don't know the sex of the snake, and so we go they them pronouns mm -hmm. just to kind of show. <laughs> and try to bring that into our elementary and other classrooms as a point of discussion. Mm -hmm. cool. so. but, but, but th thank you, thank you. Oh, I, of course, I'm always happy you. to see you. Maybe I will have to stop by the fifth floor. Fifth floor. You could invite us to the bracket next year, too. That's a possibility. Right. We can <laughs> talk to Ms. Diggins. And right. she can Absolutely, okay. yes. Yeah. Room 524, Anyone? you're always welcome. And if you want to see my, my critters, especially. Oh, yeah. Any other questions, Mr. Okay. Cardin? Oh. Could you give an example of a phenomena driven storylines? What kind of science? Yes. Is that? So, for example, I would show a picture of a GIF, a GIF of a cat. And I don't know how many of you have cats, but if you do, you know that cats can miraculously fit in very weird spaces, <laughs> right? <laughs> And so looking at that and showing that gift, my, my question would be, is it a solid or, is, are cats solids or liquids? <laughs> right? And, and that is yeah. the storyline. And so we kind of follow this idea through and we're constantly going back to the phenomena because most, most kids, not all, have experienced a cat and or the GIF is really, really um, able to kind of show that. And so we're constantly going through that and, and giving them the storyline and allowing them to kind of drive the instruction um, and for them to come up with questions, for them to engage in academic conversations with each other and figure it out without the teacher necessarily telling them the answer. Because if you think about it in terms of the definition, it could be a solid or a liquid. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so then one suggestion actually for all of the curriculum directors going forward is, I mean, to me that sounds like deeper learning. Mm -hmm. right? So I would tie it more explicitly to our strategic, now that we have the strategic plan, Absolutely. the stuff that is deeper learning, kind of identify it. Because people are going to be asking us, what does this mean? What is deeper learning? And if we have some concrete examples like that, then it's really helpful. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and then relatedly, so the other other key item is MTSS. Mm -hmm. We don't really hear about science in MTSS. So do you plan to participate in that or what sort of 
role does science have with that initiative? Yes. <laughs> um, I, I think my entire goal is to strengthen our tier one instruction um, and, and really work on that through, you know, UDL, through thinking about um, our, our students who are marginalized and really trying to I increase that tier one instruction so that we don't have as many um, pullouts or, or tier two or tier three interventions. I think that the emphasis isn't always placed on science, and, so, and I'll, I'm gonna, I'll just speak for science, um, for science yeah. um, in terms of interventions. Mm -hmm. um, but we're trying to build that at a curricular level to really improve what our tier one instruction looks like. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think at this point we should be done, um, but thank you very much, Dr. Hoya, for coming and speaking with us. Absolutely, and thank you all. It was a pleasure to see you all in uh, fifth floor. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
and that we are, similarly to as Dr. Hoyo said, providing a wide range of electives, right? The core, the core classes, once you get through um, AHS, we, we have many, many electives that students can choose from, everything from the social history of sports uh, to this year will be, um, y'all approved, thank you very much, um, ethnic studies for, for next year, for the 23-24 school year. Um, these were our goals for the department this year, so we've really worked hard to have discussions and have critical conversations around how we increase the voices of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, Latino folks, queer and disabled voices in the curriculum. Um, our teachers have done a lot of intentional professional development and um, collaborative work in, in both understanding where those voices are missing if they're missing, why they're missing. We've started to really talk to students about silences in history and how silences are created, um, and then do the work to, to make sure that we can, we can uh, use scholarship to fill those existing gaps in our curriculum. We're really working to center, center student identity in all of our classes, so we've reframed different classes to make sure that we're um, both starting the year in some places with an identity-based unit, and then making sure that students have, again, multiple means of demonstrating their learning that best reflect um, their learning modalities and how they see themselves in the curriculum. And we continue um, as, as APS strives to be more inclusive and equitable, we continue to do the own, our internal work of uncovering our own biases and working to better understand where our own blind spots are in creating um, these types of curricular changes. So I'll go level by level. Um, at the elementary school, they, um, I came in. Uh, my predecessor, Denny Conklin, had set them up to do a multi-year curriculum revision, and I came in in the midst of that. And so we continue to do that work. Um, the revision is ensuring that our curriculum is inquiry-based and culturally responsive. This ties in really well to what I'll talk about with the, um, our partnership with the ELA team and the science team. Um, as we roll out the new literacy curriculum, we're, we're really well poised to have a thoughtful integration of the two subjects. Um, our two elementary social studies coaches continue to facilitate ACE blocks and pilot the new units that they're rolling out with teacher and student feedback. That's been a really exciting piece of this year is getting to pilot these and get feedback from the students too on how this is going and how they're experiencing the new curriculum. Uh, K-12, we completed a curriculum audit and that work is ongoing. So my goal in coming into this position was to know what we're doing and how it's going and the teachers all participated in that process um, and we have data now to, to say this is the skill, this is the content that we teach in each unit, K-12, um, and these are our action steps moving forward to continue um, to be thoughtfully revising um, and progressing our work. Uh, we got a wonderful grant from the AEF to send a number of element, send both the elementary coaches and a number of elementary teachers and leaders to the National Science or National Council for the Social Studies Conference in Philadelphia this winter, and they came back with lots of good resources that we've been able to use to update our curriculum. At the middle school level, um, so Noah Cabral moved from Gibbs to Audison this year, which was really great, and he joined the civics team. Uh, again, we worked on the curriculum audit at both of these schools. Thank you to many of you, um, Allison, Paul, and Liz for being at Civics Day. Civics Day was a huge success at Audison. Um, Rod, I'm sorry, you were there too, taking pictures. <laughs> Not on a panel, thank you to our panelists. Um, a huge success. We had over uh, 25 local leaders, people that work for the school, that work for the town, that work for outside organizations, come in and serve on panels for students to be able to ask them questions related to their civics action project. Um, it was a, a, a true team effort with the eighth grade civics teachers and myself to be able to coordinate with all of these people and bring them in so that the students could be, engage in a really rich dialogue um, on topics they cared about and they chose and be able to ask questions to experts um, in the fields for which they were speaking. Um, we have four students progressing to nationals for National History Day, which is very exciting. That uh, final is in Baltimore in June. And uh, Shana Byrne just was named Mass Council of the Social Studies Middle School Educator of the Year, um, which she is most deserving, and she leads um, a lot of our ancient civ work at Gibbs. At the high school, uh, we welcomed three new teachers this year, Emily Tessier, Alexis Daggett, and Alvaro Quintero. Um, Alvaro is in a one-year position. He, uh, we are very much going to miss him, though. He's been an incredible asset to the department. Um, we had students participate at the high school for the first time in a little bit um, in National History Day, and they did quite well. 
And we're really excited, looking forward to next year to pilot um, our AP African American Studies class. We're really excited to be part of that pilot work um, and ethnic studies. And we had enough students, I think, sign up for AP African American Studies that we'll be able to run two, two classes, which is, speaks volumes, which is really exciting. And so for next year, we are making, along with science, um, a transition from elementary coaches to uh, curriculum specialists. This will just give them more flexibility to be able to partner um, with teachers in developing curriculum, especially considering um, how we're going to be thoughtful about interdisciplinary units. Um, and so we're really excited about that. It gives them a little bit more flexibility in their work. Um, we're going to continue, based on our data from the curriculum audit, continue our long-term curriculum revision across all levels, um, making sure that we are both up-to-date and um, research-driven in what we're able to offer to students. Um, the pandemic is, quote, over, so we're looking to get back out into the community and increase our opportunities for place-based learning. We've had a number of teachers go on field trips this year, um, and as things have opened back up, we want to be able to get more students um, out um, and experiencing um, history and social studies in the world. That is a best practice in the discipline, so we're looking forward to that. Um, as we continue to work across the district, across departments, um, we want to be intentional in how we're helping students to develop their skills K-12. And so as we were able to understand from our own curriculum audit what skills we are currently teaching, we want to be thoughtful in partnering with the other core disciplines especially to understand how they're teaching certain skills. So for example, research writing, how is that being taught in other disciplines? What are the ways that we can uh, mutually support each other? And as I said, we're really excited about the AP African American Studies pilot. Um, I would love to take your questions. Any questions? Ms. Morgan. Um, can you speak a little bit more? I have two, but the first one is the the coach versus, I, I guess I don't really understand how being curriculum specialist makes it more flexible. Sure. So because we only have two coaches across the many elementary schools, um, their role is a little bit different than um, a, a building-based coach. Social studies, for the most part, is taught at every school at the same time. Um, and so they cannot be in all of those places at once. So their ability to coach anyone through a cycle is quite limited, but their ability to work with people on curriculum development is, is much more free because they can meet during ACE vlogs, they can meet during people's preps, but because they can't be in multiple places at once, getting into classrooms to, to model and to teach, to co-teach social studies is quite difficult. So this just gives them more flexibility. It is essentially what they're already doing, but we're just reframing the title to, to reflect the, the actualities of what they're doing. Great, okay, super. Actually, that answers both of my questions. Oh, cool. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Cardin. Great, thank you. Um, when you talk about understanding characteristics of cultures that historically marginalize vulnerable populations, can you give some examples of things that you've been discussing and you've, you've come up with? Yeah, absolutely. So kind of one, one of the things I said was um, about kind of the silences and so for example um, a lot of students are really last year in the diverse perspective survey noted that there was no queer history in us1 and so we've really been talking about why is there no queer history in us1 and part of the reason is that the people who write history right the the way silences develop is an event occurs um people remember that event people in power synthesize that event and the event is disseminated through time through through various layers, right? And so we've been really trying to be more intentional about helping students understand why it's hard to find some information about certain groups of populations and, and how power um, and memory kind of interact in creating what we have at this up to this point really called the mainstream narrative and how we're trying to like break that apart. Um, another example is when we teach about enslavement, teaching not just teaching the brutality of enslavement, right? Students will understand that. They're, many of them are growing up in the United States. That information is very widely available to them. What is not as widely as available is like the stories of resistance and revolt and empowerment that have come from the black community as they, as they survived and then thrived through US history. So how do we create those counter stories to kind of dispel and counteract these mainstream narratives that have developed while helping students understand why these mainstream narratives have developed. Great, thank you. Yeah. What had concerned me when I saw that was there was, you know, a work um, about white supremacy culture that has been, has been going around for years that somewhat randomly selected things like urgency and professional, perfectionism as um, examples of white supremacy culture. 
and it's sort of been debunked and there's a lot of debate over whether that's even an appropriate work to use. So I just wanted to make sure that we sort of weren't pulling out these specific characteristics and, and, and working from that perspective. Sure. Great, thank you. Ms. Lexton. Thank you um, for this presentation. Um, so my question is to, because you're there, um, okay. it, sort of, it, came, <laughs> it came to me, um, you both mentioned um, the elementary literacy program yeah. integration, and I, I'm just really mindful of the fact that elementary teachers are getting a new literacy curriculum, and I know the intention of it is for it to be integrated, and that's part of why the change is happening, but I just, I'm wondering how, um, how teachers are going to be supported in what in some ways feels mm -hmm. like three new curriculums and maybe four if math gets added in there too. So just sort of how you think about. So I think one more early stage is right, we don't know what the program is yet and so it's hard to speak to that. But one thing that Dr. Hoyo and I have started to do is look at how the curriculums that we're look the, the, the curriculums that we're aiming to choose from, how they are set up and how our existing mm -hmm. curriculum in science and social studies how we can remap it to make sense, right? So for example, in EL, there is a unit in fourth grade on the American Revolution in English class. But we have a lot of resources uh, in social studies on the American Revolution that are currently taught in third and fifth grade. But we could move them and adapt them for fourth mm -hmm. grade. And so what is what are the existing things that make sense and how do we need to reframe our map? I think when it comes to teacher support, I think two things come to mind is another reason that the curriculum specialist title is helpful is because we have these coaches who will be able to work with teachers in understanding how this all makes sense, right? It's kind of having another pair of eyes to, you know, the literacy coaches and the ELA coaches will be doing their work, but the social studies and the science coaches can be, can be helping to understand, okay, if this is the way we're talking about close reading in ELA in this program, we can do the same thing in social studies so that we're reinforcing this skill. We can do the same thing in science so we're reinforcing this skill so that we're teaching smarter instead of harder a little bit, um, which is ultimately the goal of integration, I think, in interdisciplinary learning. And so our goal, I'll, I'll speak for both of us, we're working on it tomorrow with our coaches, is to really think about how we can help set things up so that we're mm -hmm. able to help teachers work smarter, not harder, and so that we're all using common language across all three disciplines so that we are able to make a more cohesive learning experience rather than teach students you know, five different ways to annotate a text. Every year, you're in an elementary school especially, what can we do to be thoughtful about this is, you know this protocol, now you just have multiple ways to, to at bats, if you will, to practice. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Mr. Thielman? I had, I had two questions. One, you began by talking about uh, your own immigration story, and um, I'm just wondering, do you, does, does, how does immigration or migration studies flow into our curriculum at all, or does it at all? Good question. Um, so in, in elementary school, there is a migration immigration unit. Yeah. Um, that's depending on where the literacy program falls right now. Right now it's in fifth grade. It might be different next year. Um, in global studies um, in, se in seventh grade, um, the teachers, interesting, you asked about climate change previously. Um, we do quite a bit on climate change, especially when we t study South America in global studies and talk about the deforestation of the Amazon. Um, that was a really successful project pretty much across the seventh grade this year. Um, and we talk about migration and immigration a little bit through, um, through global studies. When we get into high school um, and into modern world specifically, um, and then US one, we talk about forced migration certainly in the, in the forced movement of black uh, Africans into the United States. And then as we get going, um, we, we talk about immigration laws through history. So start the, the big one that you start in US one is the Chinese Exclusion Act. Right. And then moving forward um, as we get through US two and into the you know, post 20th century, the certainly the new laws around immigration um, come up. We do not have any electives that are specifically around migration and immigration, um, but it is a course standard in different places of the curriculum from the frameworks. Yeah, it's a big, broad topic. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and actually, in, in the area that we're in, there's actually, there's, you know, our city, Boston, 29% of people are born outside the United States, and so it's fascinating to yeah. think about all that. Okay, um, and re could you just talk a little bit about how you incorporate or integrate research skills into the curriculum? Yeah, definitely, and so this is actually a conversation that I think is happening. We're going to start to have at AHS more. Um, 
because it's changing and it like yeah. chat gpt and ai is changing the way we think about research and it has to change the way we think about teaching research and so i i kind of really want to give you an answer because we really need to be thinking critically over this next year about how we're doing that and what teaching research in the age of ai looks like um, I'm excited about that discussion. I think we, you know, we have a lot of opportunities here to really help students understand how to be writers, because it's really easy to have an artificial intelligence do the research for you. Yeah. One of the things we do, though, is we're really intentional about how do we get students to think critically about sources, and how do we get students to think critically about information and where that information is coming from, what the perspectives of the people are who are creating that information or that source, and, and being able to understand what bias is and why bias matters, so. Yeah, I mean, it's changing pretty quickly, so I, I don't yes. expect you to have it figured out. I just wanted to see. I'll ask Chad GPT later. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, man, that's pretty quick, yeah. And you have a message for us in the West of Cambio? What, what do you Oh, it says the change is in our hands, so you ah, can take that yeah, if you yeah, want, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay. Mr. Schwartzman? Yeah, I, I'm, I, as a former third grade teacher, I, I sort of see the integration happening in the later elementary grades because one of the things that I've experienced as a teacher that third, fourth graders really love nonfiction uh, reading. And as a district administrator, I could sort of pick out MCAS scores of classrooms where there was a lack of nonfiction and uh, genuine text being taught so that with the adoption of a new literacy program blending that in it's a perfect time to start to blend that in with uh, with history and science so yeah. I'm glad we've got two good folks here who uh, it, it, with, with good leadership in the district who can think about blending that in which will also lower the uh, the work that teachers need to do to accommodate changes within three different uh, venues. Right. Um, so my underlying question, because we, we haven't met before. We met at Civics Day. Well, well I, 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 no, I love Civics Day and I love meeting you there, but we haven't met before in this setting. Sure, yes, So that's that true. school committee to department head, what do you need from us? Um, thanks, I appreciate that question. Um, <laughs> we are living as we mm -hmm. talked about earlier in an increasingly divisive time where people have really strong opinions mm -hmm. on subjects that they might not be fully informed about. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate you all approving the pilot for AP African American Studies. Mm -hmm. We have seen that be a lightning rod across the country already. We've seen College Board go back and forth on how they are not gonna do that. Um, and the work we're doing and the commitment our teachers have to doing this work and to advancing the the opportunities that students in this community have to understand the world holistically mm -hmm. is deep and, and so i'm proud I, of what you're doing and that it's like arlington to florida zero right? <laughs> we we yeah. yeah and and i think the continued support and the continued um ability for us to to do what's right mm -hmm. for our kids. Um, I know I certainly appreciate, I know my team appreciates, um, and we will continue to innovate and we will continue to help students understand why the country and why the world is the way it is to mm -hmm. the best of our ability. Um, and that includes topics that are controversial um, in other, other parts of the country or for other reasons. Well, so I appreciate the support. I'm glad you're doing that and uh, keep, keep on keeping on, you know. Thanks. Thanks. I'm um, thanks. I'd like to ask one question. Yeah, of course. So I can't find the email, but we had a complaint from a parent or a community member um, that said they'd talked to some middle school students and the students had learned some stuff in history and that's the part that I don't remember, but that they didn't know when wars were or, or concrete facts like that. And I just wanted to know, can you talk about how what we're teaching aligns with the state standards and um you know i'm assuming that we do and and that yeah yeah so. Ev i mean everything does yeah. and the, the frameworks are huge um and i think best practices in history education are not memorizing names and dates but understanding chronological thinking mm -hmm. um we don't I'm assuming they're thinking like 20th century wars. We don't really teach 20th century wars until ninth grade. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense that they might not know, right? Um, because that's not a middle school standard. Um, 
So I, I don't know if that answers you. It's hard yeah, for me to I, answer without I, a lot of context. That, that yeah. answers as much okay. of my question. Is, thank yeah. you very much. Of course. Um, before you all leave, I just want to say, when it comes to our work in deeper learning, mm -hmm. um, the work of the social studies and science departments has really been trailblazing. Mm -hmm. uh, the work they're already doing to think about how we do integrated um, studies in, at the elementary level is very exciting, mostly because the reality of the matter is that we do not have enough minutes in the elementary school day to meet the mm -hmm. minimum recommended guidelines in the frameworks mm -hmm. for the state of Massachusetts, and so the way you uh, find ways to resolve that challenge is that you look at how to integrate curricula together and you think really creatively about how to build students background knowledge in particular topics so that their vocabulary improves and their comprehension improves and their excitement about topics that are relevant to them usually linked to science or social studies of the arts um, are things that compel them. So I want to thank the two of you for the work that you've done to make our classes and courses really engaging for students. It's been really innovative and we're happy to have you on the deeper learning team and Dr. Hoyle on the deeper learning team and also on our deeper learning dozen team. Um, they are really doing, to Mr. Carden's point, excellent work in this area and moving us forward on priority one. So thank you. Thank you, you very much. Time. Appreciate it. <laughs> And with that, we move on to the lab collaborative agreement, Dr. Homer. So um, I don't have significant updates on this besides that uh, we met with uh, members of the lab collaborative to discuss the collaborative agreement um, and some concerns that we brought up relative to Watertown joining. Um, I don't know if members, of, I'm even trying to remember which subcommittee met. Oh, it was budget. Was budget? Okay. Um, to talk about that. I don't know if other committee members have additional things they want to note that came up from that meeting, but we had Mr. Lupini with us, um, who's the former interim executive director of lab and uh, Pam Gerard, who is the current executive director of lab because that conversation kind of taken place over the course of a year and a half. So. Okay. Mr. Cardin, you want to speak as budget? Sure, yeah. So, um, uh, as Dr. Homan mentioned, they uh, came and addressed, tried to address the concerns that I had raised um, about the financial impact of Watertown joining. Um, they're basically, it's a small impact, um, uh, but they think that overall, you know, it's $47,000 that Watertown is saving, but they'll probably send more students and that'll bring in more revenue. So, um, and they, the sort of in, in exchange for that, they get access to the uh, career technical space that Watertown has. Watertown is in re is rebuilding their high school. They were actually asked by MSBA to vacate their building and, and move to a completely modular building to to, to speed up <laughs> the building process as opposed to what we were doing because costs are uh, costs are escalating so fast. But anyways, so in the temporary space, they're actually it's right next door to their middle school. There's they're building CTE space in the middle school for the next few years. So um, the way it will work is the students in this program will still be housed in Belmont, but they will go over to Watertown to use the facilities a couple of days a week or whatever. So um, that's something that's missing, has been missing from their programming since Minuteman was rebuilt because Minuteman was rebuilt smaller and doesn't have the space or willingness to accommodate them. So. Um, uh, that's sort of more background on why they're adding Watertown. Um, uh, I think the whole issue of the way different towns provide different facilities and whether um, the 25% surcharge that's given to students that come from non-member districts is sufficient to compensate us for the space that we're providing is something that needs more examination and they've sort of agreed that, um, you know, to look into that so I will be pursuing that. On the other issue as far as financial commitments, uh, you know, given where we are in this, the process, we can't really add it to the agreement, but I think we can ask the board, the lab board, to develop that as a policy, that they will not agree to a financial commitment more than, you know, 10% of their budget or whatever is appropriate without coming to the individual school committees for approval. So um, I think we can get to the same place in a different different methods, so I'm, I'm comfortable with, with um, proceeding with approval. And, and they did agree to that in mm -hmm. theory about yeah. mm -hmm. making that a policy. Mr. Schlickman? Yeah, I learned, excuse me, I learned a lot at this meeting and that there's, 
about 50% of the students who are served uh, by lab or from out of district uh, are out of collaborative, I still think, in terms of regional vocationals instead of collaboratives. But that's sort of par for the course for all the collaboratives. But that the question of the individual districts within this particular agreement providing space is that it's not really a budgeted line item within how they're playing and it's traditionally been compensated back through, through a credit system. You know, they, I, I sort of understand the thinking behind that and that they're willing to look at that. The other thing is in terms of Watertown, um, it made sense that Minuteman wasn't going to participate with lab as right now only two of the lab towns are in the Minuteman district. Two of them are in Shawshine, so that we don't really have a nice overlap. And to bring in Watertown uh, with a vocational uh, component makes a lot of sense. I was assured by Mr. Lupini, uh, I believe it was Mr. Lupini who said this, is that uh, all of the programs that they were accessing in Minuteman and that are the ones that they want for the students within the context of lab are provided for in Watertown and will be made available to lab <coughs> students. So with this discussion, uh, I, I'm putting aside my skeptic's hat and saying, yeah, this is a good thing. I think we should adopt it. Okay. That was a motion. I moved to adopt it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, Ms. Jenkins, that was the motion was made by Mr. Schlickman and seconded by Mr. Thelman. Is there any further discussion? I just, Morgan, I mean, I I learned more about lab in that budget meeting than I've learned being on this school committee for I don't know how long I've been here five years. Um, so I thought it was really helpful. I think that it's worth um, considering doing that more regularly so that we have a better understanding of, of what this looks like. And I think we asked some really good questions. Um, <laughs> some really good questions that, that probably need to be asked a couple of times until we get some, some answers to those questions. So um, anyway, thanks to um, Dr. Alice Nampi and Mr. Cardin for making that happen. I thought it was very useful and we should do it again. Do you think this should be an annual thing or biannual? I think maybe annual for right now. We do have a lot of questions, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but then maybe biannual. I don't know. I, I'm not going to chair that subcommittee. I think budget's a great place for it, so <laughs> I defer to whatever you people want to do. Okay. Any further comments, questions? No. Okay. Then um, all in favor of... Uh, 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 of uh, uh, agreeing to the revisions of the regional agreement for lab. And? Authorizing the chair. And authorizing the chair to sign on our behalf. Okay. So, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that passes unanimously. And I'll sign this after. I assume that's what I've got here. Okay, great. Uh, next, superintendent's update. All right. <coughs> So, uh, Mr. Schlickman, I'm going to try to say it right. Uh, we're very, very thrilled that we have welcomed our visitors from our sister city of Nagaokokyo. 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 I was close. It's, um, it's difficult. <laughs> from Japan. Um, and they are staying with Arlington Host families this week. There they are at Wilson Farm, pictured, and we got to greet them at Dallin this morning. We did a cultural exchange of songs and music. Um, they are middle school students visiting us this week. Mm -hmm and into next week. So they'll be uh, visiting AHS tomorrow and OMS on um, Monday morning. And they're attending a Red Sox game this weekend. They also got a tour of Fenway Park yesterday and very other, various other destinations in Arlington and around the Boston area. I want to say thank you to Joanne Rautenberg, who has brought this program back to life after a four-year hiatus. We haven't sent delegations back and forth for a while because of the pandemic, and it's really great to see this um, <laughs> get some life breathe back into it and to meet our guests from our sister city. A few other updates. Uh, Deeper Learning Dozen convening is next week at Revere Public Schools. We have some new team members joining us. 
Um, both of them from the AEA, Julie Keyes will be joining us as AEA president, as well as Carolyn Snook, um, Dallin Math Coach, and we're really looking forward to adding their voices to some of the work that we've been uh, doing and thinking about now for a year and a half as an administrative team. Uh, we'll also have the new Deputy Superintendent, Mona um, Ford Walker, joining us for the convening next week. We have several administrative hiring searches going on. We have collectively spent around the table um, tens and tens of hours in interviews for the past couple of weeks because we have a lot of searches live right now. Bracket principal final round was completed yesterday uh, with an announcement coming very soon. We have completed the initial round of interviews for the director of communications and uh, family engagement with finalists being announced very soon. Um, we are going to start interviews for the director of research data and accountability um, in that second week of May. And uh, we are in the middle of con conducting or about to conduct final rounds for assistant director of high school counseling. We have three finalists, director of SEL and counseling. Um, we have two finalists, correct? <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> you, you looked at me right Bad now. timing. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, and then for assistant director of finance, we're in the middle of conducting initial rounds of interviews this week. Um, as far as enrollments go, I've had some technology issues that I believe they just fixed uh, that were hindering my ability to pull data from PowerSchool. So I will go in uh, tomorrow or over the weekend and send enrollment numbers over in your direction. So. Right. Any questions? Seeing none. Um, we move on to the consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant number 23241, $733,399.22 from um, April 19th, 2023. Draft minutes of March 30th, 23. Draft minutes. Uh, r both regular and organizational of April 13th, 2023. So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Yeah. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? So that pa they pass unan unanimously. Next we have policies and procedures. Mr. Schlickman, first read IGD and uh, IG IJR. Okay, uh, I, want, I want to emphasize that whenever there's a question or concern about anything we're doing as a community, it's imperative for us to do it in a respectful, calm manner. And that the last thing, and I'm speaking for myself in this point, the last thing I want to see is anyone feel hurt or intimidated or uh, feel a lack of belonging in this community as a result of uh, any of the actions that, that revolve around what we do. Um, which is the reason why we went and looked at our policies around uh, surrounding the topic of reconsideration of instructional resources. Uh, the research question before us is how do we preserve the right for someone to ask a question or make a challenge without creating a, a, a negative climate or atmosphere around it. Uh, and I want to compliment Mr. Thielman, who brought forth to the subcommittee a couple of excellent proposals, both for IGD and IJ-R, uh, as a blueprint for how we would handle things in the event of a curriculum challenge. Uh, we worked through this at a meeting of the subcommittee on Monday. We will convene again as a subcommittee next Monday uh, because we anticipate, or at the time we anticipated other members to have thoughts about it. Uh, and that we'd certainly want to take another look at the language to make sure the language reflects where we want to go. And by suspending the previous policy, when we go back to the point where we will open the, the district to considering challenges, we want something that will work for the district that will not create angst or turmoil, particularly for our students. Um, so the point that I will make right now is presenting these for first read. We will be wordsmithing further next Monday and then 
whatever adjustments based on the uh, thoughts and concerns from around this table uh, we can incorporate into the into the policy and make a presentation for second read and adoption at the next meeting so that if people who would like to make revisions to the text or have questions or comments about it can submit them through the superintendent and we can have them ready for consideration as the subcommittee meets at 8 a.m. on Monday morning up here. Again, I just want to say that so much work on this has been done by Mr. Thielman. I'm very appreciative of the fact that he brought us to the point where we were able to go as a, as a subcommittee and work through things pretty quickly because of the template he provided. You want to talk about this at all? Or is it um, seeing if anyone has any <coughs> questions or thoughts as, or feelings. Mr. Cardin. Yeah, so I mean, the, the, I, I raised this in an email to Mr. Schlickman. Um, I don't know if it's going to be addressed at the next, next, next meeting, mm -hmm. but um, you know, I, I don't think the appeal to the school committee part is, is, is good because this gives somebody challenging a book a right to get an agenda item, whereas somebody challenging the length of recess or anything else about the schools does not. Mm -hmm. So I, I would defer, I would, I would make this similar to mm -hmm. our general complaint policy, which mm -hmm. is really as to discretion of the chair mm -hmm. as to whether an appeal would come to the school committee or not, would be, would be on the agenda or not. Yeah, I, I brought forth your recommendation and uh, I don't think that we crafted that part of the policy, yeah. but I think it's where we want to go with okay. it. Yeah. Just like that, second, just to, mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. share so if it's okay, right? We, we had to we'll stop after an hour. Yeah. So, what would where where would that decision be made? It would be the chair would make the decision. So, like, let's say um, we have our book, right, mm -hmm. and that it goes to the principal at the school, and then they don't like what they hear there, and then they go to Dr. Homan, and she does her magic, and <coughs> then they still aren't happy with the book, and so then they go in our current peer permutation to Dr. Alice Nampy and they say, we don't like what Dr. Homan told us about this book. We want you to put this on the agenda for you to make a decision about it. And then she would have the discretion to, to say up or down. Well, on it, yeah, I mean, the way it works is there's, there's a, a school level <clears throat> reconsideration process, which means the person goes to principal, mm -hmm. whomever, the superintendent at any point in time can say, I don't want that person meeting with my principal, I'll meet with the person, or I'll designate someone else to meet with, or the principal will meet with the curriculum leader as well. So that's the school level. If they're not satisfied, <clears throat> they can go to the district level. At the district level, the superintendent has two choices. She can just send it up to us and say, I'm not, my team is not spending any more time on this, we're done. Or she can convene a committee <clears throat> appoint whoever she wants as the chair and appoint the members mm -hmm. to review the curriculum. By the previous policy, IGD, essentially, it's a review of either a vote taken by the school committee or a decision made by the superintendent, because that's how curriculum happens. Mm -hmm. So it's a review of her decision or our decision. Mm -hmm. Then once the internal group um, reviews it, they hear the, the complaint, they write a report, they make a recommendation, mm -hmm. They give it to the complainant. Superintendent reviews it first. Mm -hmm. Then they have a choice. They could appeal it to us. What Len is saying is mm -hmm. he doesn't want it automatically put on the agenda. Mm -hmm. There's a way to say that, which is mm -hmm. basically the chair shall dispose, shall respond to the mm -hmm. complaint uh, following the rules of the school committee, something like that. That, that, I'd have to, you know, that kind of sentence. And then <clears throat> following the rules of the school committee, we decide whether or not mm -hmm. We take a, she, the, the chair in consultation with us decides whether we would take a vote affirming the decision of the, of the review committee or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, the simplest thing to do mm -hmm. is once the school committee, like this, this particular issue, if the school committee takes a vote on it, it's, over, it's, it's essentially over, mm -hmm. right? It's done. We take a vote, we approve the curriculum, it's done. Mm -hmm. So the easiest thing, oftentimes, is to have the school committee take a vote. That's when you get confused when there's not a formal vote affirming the, the viewpoint of the elected officials of the town. 
So that's kind of the easiest way to, usually the easiest way to resolve these things. But in that scenario that you talked about, where the yeah. superintendent says, I'm not doing, like this was dealt with at the school level, yeah. mm -hmm. I'm not gonna put additional resources towards this, I'm sending it straight to the school committee. Mm -hmm. could, could then, in that scenario, do we see that, that still the chair could be like, we're not seeing this either? That, or, well, I would be, if, I would, if, I, if I may, okay. um, if the superintendent takes, uh, takes a report, makes a report, somebody challenges the fact that we're teaching children to write with their left hand and they're objecting to that. And she looks at that and says, well, I, that's, I'm not going to bother with this one. I'm going to send a report that there was a, uh, a complaint that we're allowing children to write left-handed, and it comes to us. She writes the, by virtue of a report. We can look at the report and say, thank you, superintendent, and not do anything with it. It would require a motion on our part. Somebody would have to say, I move that we send this to subcommittee. I move that we do something with this. La lacking a motion on our part, we're receiving a report and that's the end of it. Uh, Mr. Thielman suggests that we may want to take it up and affirm the superintendent's decision, but we're under no requirement to do that as well. And so that the only recourse a parent would have to bring it before us at that point would be to show up in public participation. I, for me, I, I, I'm like a process map person, mm -hmm. I, but that's fine. I can draw my, I, I, when we come to a place where this is, where that piece, it, wherever you guys land, then maybe what I can do is I can like, because yeah, I, I'm a like, you're here and you, mm -hmm. these are your forks and then these are your choices. And, and I, um, I get that mm -hmm. in the current draft and what I'm trying to incorporate is this desire to bypass that, which I, I, I'm fine. I just need to understand how that. We, we haven't worked with that yeah. part well, yet. Uh, I mean, it's not me, that hard to do, but I think that, I think I, the, just, Dr. Homer, oh, no, sorry. Yeah. I, I, Mr. Schuchman partially said this, uh, noted this, but if you look at the language, the appeal to the school committee is that the complainants may appeal a decision of the Instructional Resources Reconsideration Committee to the Arlington School Committee. So there's an appeal process if I have a committee that issues a recommendation that you then goes to you all. Right. But there's not an appeal if there's, if I say we're not putting more resources towards this and there's a report, there's a report to you. You know that there was a challenge, you know what the determination was, what the mm -hmm. attempt to resolve it was, um, and you can choose to take it up or vote to affirm it or whatever. But there's not sort of a formal appeal in that. Mm -hmm. Case. Right. I mean, because the public ultimately can appeal anything that right. you do to yeah. us. Should they, I mean, should they feel right. so inclined, right? And then we go from there. Mm -hmm. One, two, I have six, a, a different um, question about a different part. So it says, <clears throat> the superintendent has the authority to determine if the request for reconsideration provides sufficient information to warrant the calling of an instructional resources reconsideration committee. I guess I'm a little, like, can the superintendent just be like, mm, this This is left-handedness is not something we're even going to discuss, mm -hmm. or? Yeah, a little bit up, a couple sentences up in the mm -hmm. policy. It, it's, those two sentences should be moved, moved together. Mm -hmm. Where are you Wait. at, Lynn? The superintendent may choose not to pursue a reconsideration. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So where do you want it? Oh, I, yeah, yeah. I see it. Yeah, we were sort of debating where to put that within the stream of the text, but it's there. Maybe so people can email their. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so I guess my can, so I think that actually the sentence about may choose not to is what I was actually looking for. Mm -hmm. The curriculum is happening in the district. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I must, in most cases, the superintendent supports the curriculum that has is being delivered. So mm -hmm. it, it seems like if someone is challenging it, the superintendent has already decided that she supports the school's curriculum. So, I, I, I mean, we get great feedback all the time mm -hmm. and people bring legitimate concerns to us. And if we listen to it <clears throat> and make a determination 
on it. That doesn't necessarily mean we didn't do anything with it. Um, and that's part of the report that you all would get. So I would say I wouldn't, we don't always, we don't think we got it right all the time. I worry that this leaves room for someone to request a reconsideration and the superintendent Again, this is a policy, like part of why we're having this conversation is there was a policy before that was not clear. So mm -hmm. it, may, it may be 20 years from now, and the superintendent's like, I'm not doing this. Mm -hmm. and would, have to, would have to report to us, and we'd be able to evaluate whether that was a reasonable decision. Okay, so they, they don't pursue a reconsideration, but they report mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. to the school committee. Mm -hmm about why they're not pursuing a reconsideration. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. I mean, okay, all right, okay. The challenge no, okay. made, I declined it for this reason. Okay, this, this and is so what the happened. committee could reopen that. Okay. Okay. Um, Thank you. I think, Ms. Gittleson, did you have anything you want to add? Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to throw in something before mm -hmm. everyone else gets another chance. Um, so, I, I'm sorry I couldn't come to your meeting. I've been traveling and I just couldn't make that. Um, I have the bigger picture question of why do we have this policy? We are not required by law to have any policy of this type at all. And my question is what purpose are we serving with this policy and what are we hoping to get out of it? And then is what we have written serving these goals? And I'm asking that as a group because, I mean, I have ideas, but I'm also pointing out we don't have to have anything. We could just make this go away. It's not required by law. I've talked to uh, town council at, at length, a whole bunch. Uh, I've got them on speed dial now. And um, just if we're redoing this, I want to be sure that we're crafting a policy which achieves the goals that we're really trying to achieve. Not just the, the little one of if someone disagrees with something, but what are, why are we, why are we doing this? So. So I think there's a couple reasons, at least that we talked about, um, and Lauren Paul can add to it, but I think there were three things. One <clears throat> is to codify existing practice. Mm -hmm. So if a parent or somebody has a concern or a question about curriculum, they have, they can, they can speak to a principal, they can speak to someone about mm -hmm. it. And that happens. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we went back, to, let's say we went back, you know, there, were, there was a challenge here to the tools of the mind curriculum. No, I'm, I'm saying the, just get rid of it, mm -hmm. not, yeah, not I, I know, but I'm, mm -hmm. I'm kind of, okay. I just need to illustrate by example, yeah. if, yeah. if I can. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, so I would say one is, one is it codifies existing practice. Two, it gives a clear pathway in the event that there is a challenge. Three. Challenges like this are taking place all over the country. If you Google Darien, Connecticut, they're trying to write a curriculum. This is based on what the Cambridge Public Schools did a few years ago mm -hmm. to respond to, to complaints that were mm -hmm. coming to Cambridge. So I think it's sort of a, I think it's just a wise for a district to have a process by mm -hmm. which people can express their opinions. And it's also, it's also important to remember that we have, if we clarify that first policy, three, mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, Three, three steps in curriculum that, that's clarified in the first policy, IGD, in curriculum adoption. Mm -hmm. The superintendent by law can do it. Mm -hmm. The superintendent's added language that clarifies when we can do it. Mm -hmm. And we approve the high school curriculum. Mm -hmm. So those three actions actually make curriculum approved. Mm -hmm. They approve curriculum. And so if someone takes exception to that, mm -hmm. this gives them an avenue to go through. It gives the superintendent options to, re, to, to respond to criticisms that come. And also, it ensures that experts within the district mm -hmm. are seeing all of this stuff before it gets to a school committee mm -hmm. with a recommendation by someone who has the experience to write a recommendation for mm -hmm. us. So <clears throat> I think that's how, that's how I see it. Cambridge, Darien, lots of, lots of places are responding, are trying to figure out a way to do it. This is kind of similar to what other groups have done. It's not mm -hmm. that original. I don't, it's not that original. Um, <clears throat> and it, it gives the superintendent a process to follow and the school committee to follow ultimately. I think if we say nothing and we just mm -hmm. suspend the policy by our vote, it actually comes back into effect on May 24th. I'm not sure what, I mean, it's a confusing policy. 
Mm -hmm. I don't know what that would do if we just didn't do that. But. Well, I'm saying we can delete it. Well, no. Uh, the, the, well, we could. I mean, we could do whatever we want. It's our policy. But absent a policy, and this policy was so badly written, it was basically absent a policy. That we that it, with lacking a policy, we sat there and said, well, when we had tools of the mind, we did this, so we're going to do this again, and which was really not the right thing to do given the sensitivity of the discussion being made. I don't think people were getting emotional about tools of the mind. They had questions. And people are going to have questions all the time. No, they were emotional. Well, it, it, <laughs> not, not emotional to this level. Um, uh. So that we need a, a procedure so that we, that if somebody has a concern, we say, okay, fine. Here's the policy. This is what we're going to do. Please follow this pathway. And we'll be glad to see it when it makes it through the round. So we don't have a large uh, controversy hitting us in this room before it's been able to work its way through the system. Okay. Mr. Cardin. Yeah, I, just, I, I agree with, with Dr. Allison Ampey. We have a public complaint policy, public file KE. It states very and very succinctly what has to happen. That should be addressed as a as close to the origin as appropriate. If that's not doesn't work, go to the building principal, then to the superintendent, then to the school committee, or you can go directly to the school committee, and it's up to the school committee to chair to determine if that's something that's good, that's appropriate to go on our, our agenda. Um, so I'm I'm fine with deleting references to a curriculum challenge process and having a curriculum challenge be equal to a challenge about recess time. Okay, Ms. Morgan. Actually, Ms. Gittleson, because you, you haven't gone first. Well, I, I think... I, I'm thinking about what Mr. Cardin just said, because I'm not, it might be changing my mind. I think part of what happened over the last several weeks, in addition to the, the atmosphere around this partic the particular challenge, was I, I mean, I did hear from people that said, I had a problem with X, you know, not as big societal issue. Why didn't anybody, like, w I talked to my principal and it, or whoever, and like they told me this is how it is, and I didn't know. And I think if we don't have it in a detailed way, my concern is that we, especially given the national environment that we are living through, that we're just that we're going to have this something like this, we're leaving ourselves open to something again. And I don't know what that is, but like, but like Mr. Thielman said, like we're watching, I mean, it's just, it's everywhere and it's in Massachusetts. And if we don't want to spend every public comment period, you know, when there's a, when an issue comes up and just sort of say, well, you know, you can come here and say, whatever your complaint is and we will not respond to you i just don't think it i don't i don't think it bodes well for the sort of like the context in which all of this education is going on thank you but i'm i'm also i was reading over mr cardin's shoulder <laughs> at the other policy and trying to and hadn't really thought about it in that context so i'm still i need to think more um, Ms. Morgan. So my, so my understanding is, is that part of the, the, the way that this, that the, the fourth and fifth grade curriculum was changed was ostensibly this building level concern that, like, that, that there were parents who were concerned with the initial curriculum, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. provided feedback, mm -hmm. right? And I guess what some kind of process does is it provides protection in the event that and that that somebody was not heard in that situation too right like that 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 if if you had concerns and and there are pe there are people out who are still have concerns about whether the the current curriculum does enough in terms of 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 being um uh it, you know it d does enough period right so i guess 
I, I don't know. I, I need to. I guess I need to read Ke like in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm done. I'm done. I okay, Mr. Thelen. So I read Ke and experienced Ke, and it's. I mean, it's it's a, it's very vague. I mean, I wouldn't. I, it's very vague. I couldn't. I couldn't support. <laughs> Deleting our current policy and just telling people just follow KE, good luck. Mm -hmm. I think it's just too. Bad. I've seen it used and it's just really, mm -hmm. it's vague stuff. It's it doesn't really give um, any clear path to a resolution, mm -hmm. and it allows more ambiguity. And sometimes ambiguity is good. Sometimes you can manage ambiguity, and it's a good thing to have in a. But sometimes, I mean, I I don't. I'm not comfortable with that solution. I don't think it's a good solution. I don't think it's good for. The, I don't think it's good for the district, actually, ultimately. I don't. And I would vote against that proposal. I would hear it, mm -hmm. and I might change my mind. But I wouldn't vote. Right now, I would not vote in favor of what you're proposing at this time. I'm, I was <clears throat> I wasn't proposing that. I was just saying that that's an option. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think we've heard from everyone a couple times, unless you wanted to speak again. Well, I, I, I'm having a hard time formulating sort of my thinking, but we are an elected body by the community to create the policy, to uphold the policy, and part of the policy that exists is around approving curriculum. And so I think we need to also have as part of that policy an avenue for it to be reconsidered um, in a way that is productive, it has a clear pathway, but if it comes to us that, and I think it was like, it was how Mr. Thielman said, it is then ultimately the decision of the committee, we make a decision and we as elected officials have spoken for the community and so I think having it here uh, having a policy around, specifically around the curriculum in that way, supports that, um, that goal. Mr. Schlickman. In, in many ways, good policy from the learned folks at MASC tends to be sketchy, skeletal, and a little vague. Uh, and in many cases that works because that allows us frameworks to incorporate is to make decisions as things come about however this is such a, a, a controversial difficult minefield that I, I definitely want to have a structure for us uh, to move forward and that's uh, and, and we, we will be discussing this again on, on Monday so this discussion will end now uh, but we'd like to have something that we'll have support for when we go forward in two weeks so please make sure that through the superintendent, if you have an opinion beyond what we're saying right now, is that you can express it to us through the superintendent. Okay. I, I would just say the, uh, um, my experience on this body, the district gets in trouble when the committee hasn't taken a vote. Mm -hmm. And if the school committee has taken a vote on a, on a curriculum, whatever it is, the high school curriculum, and even, and I've been on both sides. I've been on the prevailing side of curriculum votes and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the losing side. Um, but once you take a vote, it's a vote, it's final, it's been approved. And what happened here is that never happened. And if we had done that, all this would have been over because we would have taken a vote, it would have been the public policy of the Arlington Public Schools, and it would have been over. And so you, I mean, you know, this policy gives Liz the discretion to not go through the process. but. Oftentimes, taking something to the committee, getting a vote on it, getting it approved is the best thing to happen. But they might. But not, we right. also don't want to be a school committee that's sort of willy nilly going around <clears throat> saying, "Oh, we're going to vote on your you know, know. eighth grade." Well, no, no, but like, but we need to have a mechanism mm -hmm. for the community to bring the concern mm -hmm. to which then we can make a decision. Yeah, right. Because the challenge right now, the, the part of what's hard right now is that there isn't a challenge on the table. Right, so we we go along with you know we're aligned, which is good with our district leadership around what we're teaching and learning. 
So I would feel uncomfortable if we started going out being like, well, let's let's have a vote on that civics curriculum just yeah. so that we're good for three years, right? Like I don't, we know that sounds like a really bad idea, yeah. right? So so we do want a mechanism though so that we can, so that it's very clear where we come in rightfully in the process. Well, just right? so you just yeah, IGD, written by Dr. Holman. Uh, has it has it has a, a language about what you just spoke about mm -hmm. so that we should just make sure you're clear on that okay I think we've had a good discussion mm -hmm. you're gonna meet on Monday and there's more and actually even if it wasn't approved at our next meeting we still have two or four weeks correct yeah yeah, yeah. We, we I mean, until and we can of, until yeah, the end of May um, so I think we should move along because we're now two minutes behind schedule <laughs> um, <laughs> Ooh. Subcommittee strict. and liaison reports and announcements. Budget, Mr. Carden. Uh, so we met, um, as we discussed, to hear about lab, and we also uh, heard about the um, uh, costing out of the strategic plan, and I think that was it. We're meeting again. We have a meeting scheduled for May 19th um, for further work on the strategic plan and presentation to a finance committee meeting uh, at the end of May or beginning of June. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's a long range planning committee meeting tomorrow. I'm not quite, we're not quite sure what's going to be covered. And um, for you folks who aren't on town meeting, we will be presenting the, t the school budget on Monday. Um, and Mr. Mason has provided the uh, school report electronically and the hard copies will be there on Monday. So, so you're welcome to join us. You can come <laughs> down on the floor. You've got buttons. You've got buttons. Okay. Uh, community relations, Ms. Exton. Uh, <laughs> don't you miss it? <laughs> 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 We are having um, a school committee chat this Saturday, April 29th at 11 a.m. on Zoom. Uh, Mr. Cardin and I will be there. It is, um, we are inviting Metco families, but anyone in the community is welcome to come and chat with us. Okay. Uh, curriculum instruction and account assessment and accountability. We are meeting on May 22nd to talk about district goals, um, which we will then bring to the full committee to talk about again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Facilities, Mr. Cameron. We don't have any meetings scheduled. The facilities are doing great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, policies we just heard from. I, I think you just heard from us, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, building committee. So the building committee uh, is meeting on Tuesday. We're making a present, we're gonna do a four minute uh, uh, town meeting report on Monday and um, we have received word that the turnover is now scheduled for October 11th it uh, since we took the vote to uh, uh, keep buildings up it will not impact teaching and learning and uh, we're going to talk about it more in depth uh, on Tuesday night mm -hmm. but we're in good shape it's going great mm -hmm. tours are going to take place for the building committee in June maybe the school committee too we'll get the school committee in there mm -hmm. yep. yeah okay okay uh, any liaison reports? Any announcements? Mr. Chuckman. Just want to remind everybody again, 9 <coughs> o'clock in the morning, Thursday, May 4th, which is next week, uh, MASC Day on the Hill. It begins with a seminar at 1 Beacon Street, which is the UMass Club, and then it adjourns to the State House for lobbying with our beloved legislators and the best food that will uh, approach the ca uh, Beacon Hill all year because it's catered by the vocational uh, staff and any student reps who are, are or student members who don't necessarily have to be the reps uh, are invited to come along and register for <coughs> free. So they should talk to you? You can talk to me, yeah. Right. As long as everything works within the context of the school, I don't. I don't want to go and and disturb uh, the high school's procedures for allowing students to be out and about at at events. But uh, assuming that you get permission from the school, which I think that, that they'll probably do, uh, we'd love to see you there. Okay. 
Any other announcements? Seeing none. Any future agenda items? Uh, I'd like to get on the agenda uh, two things. Uh, one, uh, when we were at METCO, we talked about submitting a resolution uh, regarding METCO funding. So in order to submit that to MASC for the Delegate Assembly in, uh, in November, I think the deadline with that is around June 1st. So we're going to have to write a resolution for that uh, between now and then. So we get that on the agenda. Um, would you write that for us? I, I will do that, and if anybody has suggestions for that, you know, let me know. Okay. okay. And I, I think we'll leave it at that for now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Seeing none, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Yes. Aye. Yes. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Meeting is adjourned at 827.